In our second scripture reading this morning, this is from John chapter 17, verses 13 through 21. This is Jesus praying for his disciples. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. We are continuing. in our time of hearing from the priesthood of all believers um, in terms of testimony and faith story. And so thank you, Matt, for sharing today. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be up here today. Will you pray with me? Holy God, I thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for all those gathered here, Lord. And I just invite you into this place. Uh, Lord, may... May my words be your words, God, not mine, but yours. And may your words fall on uh, receptive ears and receptive hearts. And Lord, I pray that your will, not mine, not ours, but your will be done. Amen. So we need to talk. That's a scary phrase, right? (laughs) Especially when you hear that from a loved one. I mean, right away, the heart starts beating a little bit faster. Oh, no, what's, what's coming up? Um, sometimes, if we're being honest, on, on this pulpit or in, on any pulpit, you're going to hear things that make you say, wait a minute, I'm not sure I agree with that. Maybe it's a little controversial. Um, that's what we're, I'm going to talk about today, about why I think it's important that we have those conversations, that we not shy away from them. And I'm speaking from experience on this, because I've, I've had some of these encounters lately, where it's either been in a a small group setting or it's one-on-one, where um, there's been some disagreements, and disagreements among, you know, people I I, um, think of as as strong believers, um, and we're disagreeing on something that's important. Um, So those those encounters have been fruitful for me, and I think they they can be for the church as well. So I'm going to lay out some, um, some reasons, I think, that it's important to have those conversations. Um, So... I think it's tempting to say, you know, why can't the church on Sunday morning just be a place of, of comfort? Why can't I come and find sanctuary and just kind of escape from you know, the day-to-day and get equipped for next week and just be soothed and not have to hear those, those difficult things? But I think that, that is one role of the church. I think it should be that. I, th- I mean, we call this place a sanctuary. This is a literal sanctuary from those things that we have to face. And, um, you know, it, whether it's here on Sunday morning or whether it's in a small group or whether it's um, through pastoral care, like during an illness, uh, one role of the church is definitely to soothe and to comfort. But it can't stop there. Um, and I'm going to lay out three reasons why I think it can't stop there. So number one is we don't live within these four walls. We live out there, and we have to be ready for the fight. And we just read, or we just heard John read from Ephesians, put on all of God's armor so that you're able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. If we're not prepared, if we can't talk about the strategies of the devil and those things that we're going to face out there outside of these four walls, we're not going to be ready. We're not going to have that armor that... um, the scripture talks about that we need to put on. Um, Jesus was, uh, in uh, the the John passage that that John just read, Jesus is praying to God on behalf of his disciples, but also on behalf of all future believers, when he says that, um, I've given them your word, and the the world hates them 
I'm talking about all believers, so that's, that's us. The world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. So th this passage is where we get the, the popular notion that we're in the world, but not of the world. Um, so if we know that we, we don't live within the safety of these four walls and that Jesus is praying for us to be safe from the evil one and that we have to put on the armor of God, then we're gonna have to confront those topics that make us uncomfortable. We can't escape them. We have to be ready for the fight. <clears throat> So that's, that's the, first, uh, the first argument I would make. The second one is that it's easy to talk about the fundamental teachings of our faith. Um, you know, like loving God, loving your neighbor, um, practicing forgiveness, being humble, um, those things that um, are just very fundamental. But it's another thing completely to, to talk about applying them. Okay, how do, how do we apply the concept of, of abundant love? How do we apply forgiveness? Um, I think if we went to everybody here and said, you know, is it, is it important to love God and love your neighbor? Yes, of course, everyone agrees with that. But what does that look like once you go out there? Um, we, we have to talk about, um, or we have to, we have to um, teach what it means to apply those. And we know from mountains of research that people learn better when they are able to take a concept and apply it. It's what we do in school, right? So, in school, you learn vocabulary words, but you don't just memorize the definitions. You use them in a sentence. Um, you, we talk about you know, concepts like, like friction and velocity in physics, but, but they mean very little until you start you know, doing, doing the experiment where you drop the egg from on top of the ladder and see if you can build a contraption to protect it, right? Then you learn about velocity and forces. You drop a car down a ramp and you learn about friction, right? Um, so that's when you start internalizing those things. Math problems, or wor math word problems. Right? We love those, right? I remember thinking, why am I reading words in math class? This is not English. Why am I reading words? But it's, it's how you learn to apply the, the fundamental concepts. So um, it's the same with our discipleship journey. So we have the basic tenets of our faith, but they mean nothing if we don't know how to apply them. Um, we can look to Jesus. Jesus was our greatest teacher, right? What, what did Jesus do? He, I think he taught the basics, but he also taught, he, he gave examples on how to apply them. So he taught about God's radical forgiveness, and then he told the parable of the prodigal son. So this was a real life example that people could grab onto, that they could relate to, and say, oh, that's what abundant forgiveness is. I, I understand now, this father who was welcoming back his, um, his son who's gone off and just done terrible things, but he welcomes it back. That's what God's radical forgiveness is. I get it now. Um, he said, blessed are the meek and the poor and those who mourn, and then he, what did he do? He healed them. He went to those people and he comforted them and he ate with them. He said, blessed are the humble. Okay, well then he went and he washed his disciples' feet. He got down on his knees and washed his feet. He was living out the very lessons that he was teaching. And then my, my favorite example is teaching about loving your neighbor. Okay, the, the, the concept of loving your neighbor goes back to uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, and it, it's, it's a concept that all the Hebrew people from Jesus' time would have been uh, very familiar with. So they grew up with it. It was, it was normal to them, love God, love your neighbor. Um, so in Jesus' time, a, a man comes to him and says, what must I do to be saved? Okay, love God, love your neighbor, I got it. Well, uh, the man pushes Jesus a little bit more and says, who's my neighbor? And that's when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. So, if you, if you remember, the Hebrews and the Samaritans did not like each other at all. I mean, these were, these were warring factions almost. Um, and he tells the parable of, of the Hebrew man who's laying on the side of the ditch after he's been robbed and beaten. And um, there's other, other Jewish people that, that pass him by, people that should have cared for him. And the Samaritan, the one who should have hated him, sees him, uh, picks him up, bandages his wounds, puts him on his donkey, carries him to an inn, pays for his care. That's the man who, um, who was a neighbor. And I can, I can imagine the man who came to Jesus and asking, what must I do to be saved? And hearing, okay, love God, love your neighbor. I'm familiar with those passages, got it. Um, but then hearing this, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, I can see he probably was a, like, a, like a deer in the headlights. You mean, that's what I have to do? That's why we have to talk about 
applying the fundamental tenets of our, of our faith because um, they, I think they mean, they mean so much more when we, when we see how to live them out. The third reason I would argue is that we have to look to Jesus' example. He, he was a boat rocker, for lack of a better term. Um, he, he wasn't concerned about upsetting people in his ministry. He was truly a revolutionary. Um, Jesus said, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. That sounds pretty uncomfortable, right? This is a, a man who overturned the tables of the money changers in the temples. He violated the Sabbath. And, that, and that's, it may not sound like a big deal to us, um, walking through a field of grain and, and plucking the grain because he and his disciples were hungry or healing on the Sabbath. That was a huge deal, violating the Sabbath. I mean, the, holding the, the Sabbath, um, uh, ho holding to that concept of, of no work, and they had like 31 different uh, things that you, you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Violating that was huge. He, but he did. He, he, he violated it. He called out the hypocrisy of the teachers of the law. Jesus didn't shy away from confronting difficult things. That's, that's the bottom line. So we can't shy away from the thorny topics either. I think the stakes are just too high. If we're going to be equipped for the battle, then we have to talk about the battle lines. So I mentioned some of my recent experiences. I, um, we had a men's retreat recently, and we had some tough conversations there. I mean, just to be honest, we talked about scripture and how we view it and interpret it and apply it. Um, we talked about gun control, which wasn't on our agenda at all, um, but it, it came up, and as, as things do when you spend a weekend together with, with guys. We talked about the concept of gun control. Um, it was a good conversation, and it wasn't easy. Uh, I learned some things from it that I didn't know, and one, one of the, um, the other people we, I was talking to threw out a fact that turned out to be incorrect. So they did some fact checking, and that person came back and said, you know what, folks, I, I was wrong, um, and I, let, me, let me correct the record here. And that's what, that's what we do. And we hold each other accountable. It's iron sharpening iron. And, while the conversation wasn't uh, comfortable, it was fruitful for, for both sides. Right? Um, of course, we, in our small group, we've had all kinds of um, tough conversations. And the, the small group leaders actually get together and have their own small group where we have a lot of hard conversations. And that's just the way it is. But they're fruitful. They, they, they truly bear fruit. They bring us closer to each other and definitely closer to God and I think what God wants of us. And I had a, an experience recently where I, I invited um, one of the people from my small group to, to breakfast, and we had um, really good conversation. I mean, it was uh, coming, from, coming from this, the topic that we talked about from completely, um, maybe not completely, but, but different sides. We, we have different experiences and different viewpoints, but we just talked. We, we, um, we, we wanted to, to share our experiences, to share our viewpoints, it was productive. I mean, we, we, left, the, we left the breakfast um, with a handshake and a hug, and it, it's gotten us closer, closer to each other and um, closer to understanding each other better. So through all, all my experiences, I'm convinced that the tough conversations are, are just that. They're tough, but they're, they're vital. They're extremely important. Um, the, the, the experiences that I've had I, have been productive I think because we followed a few ground rules, and I want to just go through some of the, I think the ground rules that we've followed that um, can be a model for, for the church or for anybody who's ready to have these hard conversations. So, so number one, we started from a position of respect, respect for each other, and that respect was gained from the fact that we had long-standing relationships. So it sounded like we we're going up to a stranger on the street and, hey, I want to engage you in a debate on this. You know, these were folks that, that know each other and, and respect each other. And that's important. Those, those relationships are important. Um, number two, we, we're not trying to change the other person's mind. I think that's important. We, we, we want to get into a debate sometimes, I think, and, and convince. And that shouldn't be the goal. The goal should be to try to understand. So we, we go into it and... Um, Say, look, here, here's, here's what, I, what I think and why. And the other person listens and truly listens to, to understand. Um, and that's my next point. Listen, listen more than talk. Listen to understand. Um, it's one thing just to be quiet and let the person talk. But as you're, as you're being quiet, truly try to, to empathize and understand what they're saying. That goes a long way. 
the fourth, um, the fourth reason that, that I think these conversations have been productive is because they were grounded in faith. And we're coming from a position of faith. Now, how we apply that faith might be different, but the fact is it was, it was rooted in faith. And number five, it was rooted in prayer. Um, so um, prayer surrounded this whole process, prayer that God would lead us um, how we wanted to, and um, holding each other up in prayer. Right? So uh, let's not pretend that, that what we hear preached from this pulpit is always going to be quote unquote right. Uh, pastors are, are human too. They're not always going to get it right all the time. But when the conversation begins here, you can pick it up and you can continue it. So my recommendations for when you hear something up here that, um, that troubles you or that you don't like, number one, don't be a reactionary. Um, take some time, pray about it, do some scripture reading. Seek, what, seek God's will because your first reaction might be uh, your will, what you think should have been said or what you think that, um, the answer should be. Take some time and, and try to find out what God's will is. Uh, number two, I think it would be helpful to understand what the United Methodist Church's official position on whatever the topic is. Understand what the church's position is. You can go and you can read the, the Book of Discipline and the Social Principles. The Social Principles, you can find it online. It's a list of pretty much any, any topic that's, um, that's out there today, death penalty, euthanasia, abortion, anything. And you can find out what the church's official position is on it. Now, notice I didn't say you have to agree with the position, but I think it's helpful to know where the church is coming from from an, from an official standpoint. Um, thirdly, seek, seek out another believer to, have, to, to start having a conversation about whatever it is that you heard up here. Now, the, the small group, your small group is ideal for this. It's already set up as a safe place and a safe time with you know, um, confidentiality where you can have those conversations. You can, you can start um, hearing what other people think about it. Um, and then practice empathy. Just seek to understand um, the other side of the coin. Uh, convey your side, but don't try to, don't try to change minds. Let, let God do that. So in conclusion, I think Epworth can be both a place of, of soothing, of comfort, of, of finding that sanctuary and that comfort. And it can be a place to be uncomfortable as we tackle tough issues together. Um, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And the Apostle Paul said, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. So there is that place of comfort that has to be there. But Jesus also said, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. So I think we can embrace the duality of our mission to, um, to both soothe the troubled soul and to confront the difficult topics um, so that we can better live out our baptismal vows. So I invite any of you into further conversation with me uh, on any topic, this topic or any topic. I'll, I'll do my best to make myself available to you. Um, I encourage you to explore the topic further in your small group. And I invite you to any administrative resource team meeting. Uh, that's, that's the leadership council of the church. We've intentionally scheduled those meetings for um, after worship on the last Sunday of the month to try to make them more, more accessible. Um, there's, there's one today, as Pastor Kate said. So I thank you all for indulging me today.